Welcome, my name is Carl Mayton and I'm Director of the LCT Centre for Knowledge Building at the University of Sydney. I'm going to introduce you to some ideas that will help you conduct research projects with collaborators from different fields of knowledge. These ideas are from a widely used approach to education called Legitimation Code Theory, or LCT. And what you'll learn from this video will be directly applicable to an assignment in which you will be mapping ways of thinking. But the ideas will also be useful beyond that assignment. They can help you plan and research a project together. You can use them to allocate tasks and communicate better as a team. And they'll help you to avoid many of the problems faced by teams who come from a range of different intellectual fields. You can also take what you'll learn here into the future. The ideas are useful for any situation in which you engage with other people, whether they be professionals from another field, or clients, or customers, or even friends. So what I'll discuss is directly relevant to your assignment, but it doesn't end there. It'll help you through your project work and beyond the unit. This video has four main parts which are bookmarked. First, we begin with the rationale for all this, why it's important to map different ways of thinking, and the role it plays in the unit as a whole. Second, I'll introduce some concepts from LCT to help you map different ways of thinking. Third, I'll give an example that uses those concepts to code the ways of thinking brought by a group of students to university and how those clashed with the ways of thinking of their teachers. And in the main part of this talk, I'll use the concepts to discuss a group research project. We'll see what different ways of thinking can reveal or conceal about an issue, problems that can arise when they come together to collaborate on a project, and how you can use the ideas to avoid or resolve those problems. I'll start then by discussing why it's useful to map different ways of thinking and how the approach called LCT is useful for doing that. As you know, you're going to research a complex, real-world problem, and you'll do so in collaboration with students from different subject areas. Now, doing research that successfully combines different fields of knowledge is not just a case of putting people into groups and hoping it works out, like throwing you all into a blender and turning it on. That blender model can lead to all sorts of problems. Why? Because you each bring with you different sets of dispositions, or ways of acting, thinking, and being. These result from your previous experiences in life, your upbringing, your family, and education. Most directly significant here is that you bring years of experience of learning different subject areas. Now, saying that is more than pointing out that you bring knowledge of different facts and theories and methods. A discipline is no more a collection of facts than a house is just a pile of bricks. What also matters is how the bricks are put together, the architectural principles that underpin how the content knowledge is selected, assembled and put to use. One graduate quality that the university wants you to come away with is called disciplinary depth. And by that they don't mean they want you to leave with a large bag of facts. It's also about having learned principles for selecting which ideas are relevant, principles for combining and assembling those ideas in meaningful ways, and principles for enacting those ideas to provide insights and to solve problems. Now, you may not have learned those principles explicitly. They may be part of what's called a hidden curriculum, things you don't realise you're learning when you're busy learning content knowledge. For example, if we all went to an art gallery and I led a discussion on the art that we see there, you might learn some knowledge about art, but you'd also be learning that art is worth your time and attention, that it's important to discuss art, and that it's important to see firsthand the art that you're discussing. I wouldn't need to say those things explicitly, they're a hidden curriculum. And in fact, I've just done this myself. When I gave that example, I wasn't just giving you an example, I was also effectively saying that giving examples is important when discussing these issues. In other words, there's more to what we say than what we say. So you each bring to your group not only different content knowledge, different facts about economics or about biology or medicine or whatever, you also bring different ways of thinking. In other words, different principles for selecting ideas you think are worthwhile, putting them together in ways you think are worthwhile, and putting them to work in your project, again, in ways you see as worthwhile. In legitimation code theory, or LCT, we call what you say or do legitimation. Everything you say or do is legitimating something, such as, in the art example, seeing for yourself the things that you discuss. And the principles or ways of thinking that you're expressing are called legitimation codes. What are these codes? We can think of them as like rules of the game. Imagine your ways of thinking are like the written and unwritten rules of a sport. Not only what's legal or not, but also what's a better or a worse move to make. In the same way as what's valued in football is different to volleyball, rugby and so on, so you will value some ways of working with knowledge over others. For example, you might believe in experiencing something firsthand, 
or you might prefer to gain some kind of objectifying distance. You might value using a particular analytic procedure that you've learned, or you might feel that doing so would mean that you can't express yourself as you wish. You might value someone having years of experience at something or having certain experiences in their past because of their social background. These are all your particular rules of the game, what LCT calls your legitimation codes. And these are not always obvious or evident until you end up in what's called a code clash. Imagine if one of you is playing football and another is playing rugby together. You have different ways of playing, different ideas of what's valuable, and these would come into conflict, leading to confusion or worse. I'll discuss examples of code clashes in group projects later on. But before I go further, you may be wondering, why bother with concepts for revealing these principles? Why don't we just say which disciplines we come from? And they're good questions. Using discipline names does seem like common sense. There are faculties, departments and majors in science and medicine and sociology and business studies and so on. But what those labels mean is not as self-evident as you might think. There are different ways of thinking inside each intellectual field. And these are often the focus of struggles over which way of thinking gets to define that discipline. So what sociology means, or what science means, is often not shared among members of the field. A second problem is that people from other fields can have a very different image of what your field is like from the one that you hold. Ask what is science, or whatever your field might be, to someone from another field, and you might get an answer strikingly different to your own views. So what we mean by discipline names varies and is often contentious. A third issue is that some of you study two majors. Some of you have shifted subjects, and so your ways of thinking have had quite varied influences. And some of you might argue that your subject area is not a discipline at all. So while they can sometimes be useful as shorthand, the names of disciplines do not by themselves reveal the ways of thinking that you bring to your group. In short, there are four main reasons for mapping your ways of thinking. First, to get you to think about the knowledge you bring to your group project at a deeper level than just content. Not every project will have obvious need of chemistry content or economics or fine arts content and so on. It's the ways of thinking that you've learned in your field that can be just as important in your project work, so we want you thinking about those. Second is to give you a shared language to talk about these issues, one in which the names you use do not mean different things to each of you. Learning the concepts I'll introduce will support your communication. For example, you can discuss what ways of thinking might be needed for which parts of your project. A third reason will be to emphasize the value of collaborating with others from different fields. I'll discuss how research in LCT shows that each way of thinking, each code, is good at revealing some kinds of issues, but conceals others. So no one code is the answer. Each way of thinking has strengths and weaknesses, and they can often achieve more by working together. Knowing the different strengths of codes can also help you figure out how to conduct your research. For example, it's useful for task allocation, for deciding who should do what, or when one person's way of thinking is most needed because their code matches the task. Finally, as I mentioned, people with different ways of thinking can easily misunderstand each other. These code clashes can lead to groups failing to collaborate or failing to see their research problem in a multifaceted and complex way. So by bringing different ways of thinking to the surface, and by having a shared language for discussing them as codes, you can anticipate problems or at least be able to diagnose and solve them when they arise. And that's why your assignment will ask you to code your ways of thinking about research problems, discuss the strengths and weaknesses of different ways of thinking, and identify possible problems in collaboration and figure out ways you can avoid them. So I'll now introduce some concepts that help you do all those from Legitimation Code Theory, or LCT. Basically, LCT is a conceptual toolkit for researching and shaping practice. Some theories of education and knowledge generalize across education on the basis of studying one discipline or one set of institutions. Now, in contrast, LCT is based on evidence from research and practice in all kinds of institutions of education, from preschool to university, as well as private tuition, such as music lessons. And it's based upon studies across the disciplinary map from physics to ballet, from journalism to jazz, and from dentistry to design. It's also used to look at knowledge practices beyond education, whether they're exhibitions in a museum, the arguments made in a court of law, or the culture of the armed services. And it's not just a research framework. Educators use it to structure their curriculum, to shape their teaching practice, and to underpin how they assess students. Over the past decade, LCT has become an interdisciplinary and international community, 
and its heart is right here at the University of Sydney in the LCT Centre for Knowledge Building. Now there's a lot to LCT, it's a complex framework, but here I'm just going to pick out a few key points that we need. First, as I've already discussed, LCT views all practices as legitimation. That is, what we say and do are also messages about what should be seen as legitimate, as valuable. And LCT looks at those messages, those rules of the game, those principles, in terms of various kinds of legitimation codes. There are four sets of concepts in LCT, each looking at a different kind of legitimation code. Here I'm just going to discuss one kind of code, and that's what's called specialization codes. But before I go any further, it's worth emphasizing that the point of this is not to learn LCT. Of course, if you find this interesting and you want to learn more about LCT and about knowledge and about education, then please get in touch with the LCT Center. We'd love to hear from you. But here we're just using one small part of the framework for a very specific purpose, and that's exploring your ways of thinking about research, what they can offer to your project, and how different ways of thinking can work together. And to do that, I'll need to get a bit abstract to introduce the concepts, but then I'm going to work through some concrete examples after that. Basically, specialization codes are about what makes someone or something special, distinct, and worthy of status. It begins from the very simple idea that every knowledge claim or practice is by someone and about or oriented towards something. So any knowledge claim or practice sets up relations to an object and to a subject. And these relations are called epistemic relations between knowledge claims and that part of the world they're about and social relations between knowledge claims and the subject or the author or the actor making them. And put simply, our practices emphasize each of these relations in different ways. That is, each may be more strongly or weakly emphasized. So epistemic relations are about specialist knowledge, such as specific skills and techniques and procedures. So when what you say or do is also effectively saying that being legitimate depends upon using particular theories or methods or procedures, you're emphasizing epistemic relations. Social relations are about the attributes of knowers, something about who's speaking or who's doing something. So if your practices are also effectively saying that legitimacy depends upon your personal experience or your natural ability or being a particular kind of person, you're emphasizing social relations. So in looking at ways of thinking, we look at how strongly someone is emphasizing specialist knowledge or epistemic relations, how strongly they're emphasizing attributes of knowers or social relations, and we bring those together and we map them on what's called the specialization plane. To do that, we chart a continuum of strengths for both those relations. So stronger to weaker epistemic relations or emphasis on specialist knowledge and stronger to weaker social relations or emphasis on knowers. And then we map what you say or do using those two as coordinates, knowledge and knowers. Now, to make analysis easier, LCT identifies four main codes, one for each quadrant of the plane. And I'll take you through each one in turn. First, if what you say or do emphasizes having specialist knowledge and skills or procedures, which is stronger epistemic relations, and if you're effectively saying that that's all anyone needs, that who you are doesn't matter, which is weaker social relations, then it's called a knowledge code. For example, when the solution to a theorem is offered in mathematics, it's put forward using mathematical principles and procedures, stronger epistemic relations. That you might have 30 years of experience in maths, or that you're English or Indian, or whatever, is held to be not part of the equation. It's effectively claimed to be irrelevant to whether it's solved or not. Weaker social relations. So the way that the solution is offered embodies a knowledge code. In contrast, if what you say or do is effectively saying that specialist knowledge is not very important, weaker epistemic relations, and then instead it's all about who you are, or stronger social relations, then it's called a knower code. And this could involve a number of different attributes. It could be your first-hand experience. It could be that you're a member of a particular social category that you feel gives you particular insights, such as your gender or ethnicity or social class. Or it could be a cultivated gaze that you've gained through immersion in great works of art over a long period of time. Cultivated knower codes of that kind are often shown by people talking about the body, such as having an eye for art or an ear for music. Now, those two codes, knowledge codes and knower codes, are widely found in research. And they'll be the focus of most of what I'm going to be talking about. But LCT identifies two other main codes that I'll mention. The third is found far less often. It's where you're effectively saying that people must have both specialist knowledge and be the right kind of knower, what's called an elite code. 
For example, in 17th century England, in the early stages of the scientific revolution, to be seen as a legitimate scientist, it was not enough to follow the right kind of scientific procedures, such as experiments. You also had to be a gentleman. You have to have the right social class and the right gender. Another example of an elite code can be found in professional musical performance, where it's often not enough to be technically proficient. You also need to be able to show that you're expressing your personality in your playing. But note that this code, an elite code, is not common. Sometimes newcomers to LCT look at what someone's saying or doing and they see that there's knowledge involved and that there are knowers present and they think that's an elite code. There's always knowledge, there's always knowers. That's what epistemic relations and social relations are about. Elite codes are not when both are present, but rather when both are strongly emphasised as the basis of legitimacy. For example, if I say I know about Australia because I live here, I'm saying I have knowledge about Australia and I'm saying that there's something about me that's important. But what I'm emphasising is the basis of what I know is the fact that I live here, something about me. It's a knower code. But if I said that I know about Australia because I'm a professional social scientist who lives in the country, in other words, I know because I have both specialist knowledge and I live here, I'm emphasising both. That's an elite code. Finally, the last code is where you can have practices that downplay both specialist knowledge and your attributes, a kind of anything goes, and that's a relativist code. For example, if I said that no theory or method is better than any other, I'm advocating a relativist code. OK, so they're the basic concepts you're going to need. But before I discuss some examples showing why they're useful, it's worth noting that when coding your ways of thinking about research, you're not being stuck into a box. And you're not being limited to a choice of just one out of four options. The main codes are useful to simplify matters, but they're not boxes. If we want to, we could analyse every instance of something, such as everything you say and do. And we could see the range of codes that your practices embody and which codes may be dominant. You might also move around the plane, depending on what you're doing. For example, you might start in a knowledge code, and then that might weaken as you go on to do something else. And then you move into a relativist code in another context before ending in a knower code. So the concepts can be used to analyse practices in great detail and to see change over time. And you might use many codes depending upon what you're doing. But here I'm keeping it simple. You only need as much theory as the problem demands, no more and no less. And here we just need the main codes. Finally, I mentioned code clash earlier when different ways of thinking come into conflict. For example, imagine a history class in which a teacher asks, what happened in 1492? They might be operating with a knowledge code, wanting students to demonstrate their history knowledge. But then a student might say, I don't know, miss, I wasn't alive then. That's a knower code. It's saying that what matters is who you are, in this case, being there. So that student is either not understanding the basis of success or they're trying to change it. Either way, it's a code clash. And as we'll see, code clashes can cause serious problems for collaboration in groups. Conversely, a code match is when you share ways of thinking about something. And that can be useful. That can aid communication because you're on the same wavelength. But it can also cause problems for projects. If you're all code matched, if you all have one way of thinking, then as a group you may have serious blind spots that you're not aware of. I'll be giving examples of both those problems and how to avoid them through the rest of this talk. So let's now use those concepts from LCT to look at what can happen when different ways of thinking come into contact. I'll start with an example that's not about a research project or about subject areas. Instead, it's about students coming to Australia from another country. And I'll look at it because it's a great way into these ideas and there's a reading uploaded on Canvas about this study. The research was led by Rainbow Chen and looked at students from China who were studying at another Australian university. Rainbow ran focus groups to explore the ways of thinking about education that students brought from their background in China. She interviewed lecturers at that university to explore their ways of thinking about education. And she ran a series of in-depth interviews with students about their experiences at that university. It's a detailed and a rich study that I'm going to greatly simplify to bring out a couple of points that are useful for us here. First, the research found that the students brought ways of thinking about education that downplayed anything about themselves or others as legitimate knowers. For example, they viewed personal experiences as unimportant. They said that to do well, one should not talk about one's own ideas, but rather find the right answers in textbooks and from what teachers said in class. And the textbooks and the teachers were seen as legitimate because they were experts in the content knowledge that the lessons were about. So their ways of thinking about education emphasised specialist knowledge as the basis of achievement, and they downplayed their own personal attributes. In other words, students brought with them a knowledge code. 
In contrast, their lecturers said that teaching was for them not about transmitting any particular knowledge or skills. They didn't see themselves as experts in a discipline. They described themselves instead as facilitators and co-learners of the students. And they emphasised the need to encourage students to value their own ideas. Their aim was to provide a learning environment in which students could draw upon their personal experiences to teach one another. The teaching materials reflected this. There were few instructions and hardly any sources of knowledge, such as theories to learn or readings to study. Instead, students had to organise their own learning, mostly in online discussions with other students and based on their own experiences and opinions. So the ways of thinking about education of these lecturers downplayed teaching specialised knowledge or skills and saw students as already legitimate knowers. In other words, a knower code. In summary, there was a code clash between the students' knowledge code ways of thinking about education and the knower code of their lecturers. And this clash caused problems for the students. They didn't understand the rules of the game that the lecturers were playing by. For example, they didn't draw on their personal experiences in their work because they didn't see them as valuable for education. They thought the online discussion was pointless because their fellow students were not experts in specialised knowledge. And they didn't think that the lecturers were teaching them anything because they weren't telling them new knowledge. Now it's important to note that the students did not have LCT to analyse their own codes or those of their lecturers, so they didn't see that the lecturers were using a NOAA code. They didn't realise they were facing a different way of thinking about education, and instead they experienced a total vacuum of legitimacy. They couldn't see what knowledge they were meant to be learning, and they didn't see their own experiences as relevant. So they experienced a relativist code. Nothing seemed to be the basis of achievement and they experienced this code as feeling abandoned and lost. And they spoke of feeling inferior, insecure, anxious, frustrated, helpless, guilty and depressed. Their response was to continue their knowledge code. They treated assignments like traditional essays, they only read the online comments that were by the lecturer, and they created personal views by synthesising the views they found in the literature. So what can we take from this study for this unit? Well, first, that it's important to think about relations between different ways of thinking. The problems here didn't lie with the students' ways of thinking about education or with the lecturers' ways of thinking about education. It's not that one was right and one was wrong. The problems resulted from relations between these codes. As we'll see, that's going to become important for thinking about how your group can collaborate on a project. If you keep finding yourself thinking that someone's ideas are of little value, it may be that they have a different code to your own. The second point to take away is that problems often arise from codes being invisible. In this case, the students couldn't see what the lecturers wanted from them, and the lecturers couldn't see what the students were bringing with them. With LCT, we can make visible their different ways of thinking. We can diagnose problems that arise, and also, and this is the last point, we can offer solutions. Here, using LCT would suggest that either those knowledge code kinds of students shouldn't be taught using a NOAA code, or they should be taught how to succeed in a NOAA code. So by using codes, we can highlight problems and think about ways of avoiding or resolving them. I'm now going to use the concepts to discuss an interdisciplinary project. The example is imaginary, but brings together a range of real experiences. I'll code how members of a group think about research, and I'll discuss what their codes reveal or conceal about their project, how code clashes caused problems within the group, and how they could be resolved. The project focuses on the problem of obesity. Since the 1980s, the proportion of Australian children defined as obese has increased significantly. A variety of causes have been advanced, such as changes in diet and child-focused advertising, but there's little consensus about its causes or effects. So in our example, a team of students have been asked to provide answers about causes and effects that could help shape government policies towards obesity. The team comprised students from four disciplines relevant to the topic, but they soon took two different directions in their research. Two of the group, Jane and Vincent, began by carefully defining their object of study. They considered what is and is not obesity, how can causes be defined and measured, and how to define and measure effects. They then conducted a review of existing research on this carefully defined object of study, focusing on what kinds of theories and methods and data have been used before, and from this review they identified what they believed to be the best approach. They then carefully planned out the study as a series of steps with a definite sequence. This began with mining available statistics, that generated issues for study through large-scale surveys, and that in turn identified further issues to be explored in structured interviews. 
To minimize the role of researcher beliefs and to ensure their findings were generalizable, they built in reliability and validity testing at all stages, and they tried to ensure that all the interviews were conducted in the same way. Now from that thumbnail sketch, it should be clear that Jane and Vincent emphasize epistemic relations. What they see as valuable is knowledge specialized to a strongly bounded object of study, and they prefer procedures that are strongly sequenced. In contrast, they downplay social relations to knowers. They structured their study so that anyone who follows their design could do it successfully, no matter who they are. And they tried to reduce the influence of subjective beliefs, which they see as bias. So their way of thinking about research represents a knowledge code. Now, knowledge codes have many strengths. They can build knowledge quickly because everyone is using the same theory or method. They can be clear on what they're discussing, making it easier to see the limits of the study, what it is and is not looking at. And having explicit theories and methods means they can be critically examined by others. They may also bring particular issues to light. For example, by focusing on measurable data, Jane and Vincent could bring to light the effects of obesity on people's earning power. And they did so in a way that was clearly argued and well supported by evidence. However, their way of thinking about research also had potential limitations and their lack of awareness of those limitations caused problems. First, their clearly defined object of study was actually only one small part of a bigger picture. Now that's not a problem in itself. Focusing on specific parts of an issue can be valuable. But Jane and Vincent believed that their focus was all that mattered and their strongly bounded object of study was the whole thing and that became reductive. Second, their clearly defined theory or methods also became an end in themselves. They drifted into believing that using the right methods was more important than solving the problem. So it became like a cookie cutter way of working in which the theory was imposed on the data and the data they uncovered could not speak back to the research, such as raising issues they hadn't planned for. Knowledge codes can also obscure things. For example, the contribution of Jane and Vincent to the final report was criticized for ignoring the experiences of children, their parents, and medical practitioners, because they didn't see these subjective experiences as being legitimate. So knowledge codes can have potential limitations, but knowing what they are can be crucial for avoiding them. The other two students, Sam and Deirdre, went in a different direction. They believed that the experiences of those affected by obesity were crucial and could only be known by those people. They left open the question of what is obesity and allowed participants in their study, children, parents and doctors, to shape their research agenda, such as through using unstructured interviews. Like their colleagues on the team, they read existing research, but they focused more on what thinkers could offer in terms of a general mindset, rather than on specific concepts or specific methods to use. In short, they wanted to maximize the flexibility of their approach. And that, combined with the desire to give voice to those involved, led them to spend time with children and parents as a way of understanding their experiences and opinions. So Sam and Deirdre became more concerned with depth than with breadth. From that sketch, Sam and Deirdre clearly downplay epistemic relations to objects of study. They see fixed procedures as constraining, and they prefer to allow the research process to unfold in whatever direction it's taken by participants. And they're wary of imposing theories or concepts on the data. In contrast, Sam and Deirdre emphasize social relations to knowers, and in several ways using theories for them about shaping their own gaze as knowers. They view the subjective experience of others as crucial to understanding the issues, and they see research as about giving voice to those viewpoints. Now, knower codes have a number of potential strengths. They can generate rich data into the lived experience of an issue. In this example, they provided insights into the effects of obesity on the everyday lives of children. And this emphasis on experience also highlighted the diversity of factors at play. It helped Sam and Deirdre to avoid reducing the topic to a single issue. The flexibility of their approach also allowed them to pursue diverse lines of interest as they emerged. Of course, NOAA codes also have limitations. If they loosely define problems and have no clear framework, it can be difficult to critically engage with their ideas. If they focus too much on individual experience, it's easy to lose sight of bigger structural issues. And they might struggle to weigh competing knowledge claims among those they're studying. Because they emphasize the subjective nature of experience, it can be difficult to judge how much weight should be given to different people's beliefs. And that means they can have difficulty generating clear and generalizable conclusions. For example, Sam and Deirdre's contribution to the report was criticized for being too anecdotal, too reliant on quotes, and offering no clear, 
policy recommendations. Now, those are crude, brief examples of what knowledge codes and NOAA codes can offer. I am not saying that those strengths and limitations are exclusive to those codes. For example, knowledge codes can be flexible and NOAA codes can be inflexible. It depends on how they're put into practice. The point here is to illustrate that when you're addressing a wicked problem, a complex problem in the real world, no one code is the answer to everything. And on that front, I should briefly mention the other two codes. With elite codes, only specialist knowledge by specific knowers is valued, and that can set the bar high, which can be valuable if it's important for someone to have both. But it could also be exclusionary in a research project and limit your options, because it does only value those who possess the right knowledge and are the right kind of knower. In contrast, the anything-goes nature of relativist codes can offer a space for the free play of ideas. They can allow for anything and everything to be put on the table. They don't rule anything out. And that can be invaluable for generating ideas and discussion. But if it's the only code used, it can also lead to chaos because there's no basis for choosing between all those ideas that have been generated. Put simply, each code offers insights that the others do not. They each have value depending upon what you want to achieve. So when you have a complex problem, it can be useful to bring together diverse codes. And that brings us to the issue of how to do that. What problems can arise from bringing different ways of thinking together in your projects, and how can you solve them? In the example I'm discussing, the group produced a report with two parts that did not gel. Why? Well, first, they couldn't agree on what they were studying. The knowledge code pair thought a focus on the experience of obesity was a distraction from looking at its causes and effects. And the NOAA code pair thought that their colleagues' definitions of causes and effects were distanced from the lived reality of the people involved. Second, they disagreed on the value of different approaches. For example, the knowledge code pair thought unstructured interviews were anecdotal and unrepresentative. And the NOAA code pair thought that using surveys and structured interviews was imposing a top-down view. Third, how to conduct the project became a bone of contention. The knowledge code pair saw the open-ended and flexible approach of their colleagues as inefficient and lacking focus or direction, and the NOAA code pair thought that the other two were rigidly stuck in one way of working that crushed creativity and inspiration. This code clash played itself out in many small ways. For example, when NOAA code Sam put forward an idea, the knowledge code students criticised it quite bluntly. They saw it as just an idea on the table to be discussed. But he felt their criticisms were of him personally and his abilities, so he defended the idea well after it was clear it didn't work. And in that way, even how ideas are discussed can become a problem. And it's worth noting that while I'm calling them knowledge code or knower code to make this easier to follow, nobody is always one code. For example, Jane usually thinks about research in a knowledge code way. But when feeling insecure about her role in the group, she shifted code and took personal offence when her ideas were criticised without recognising the contribution she was making as a person. Lastly, the findings of the research were also the focus of code clashes. The knowledge code pair thought the other's extensive use of quotations was just filler, and the NOAA code pair thought that the use of charts and graphs was just trying to look scientific. They ended up writing an incoherent and segmented report looking at two different sets of issues in two different ways. So in this case, there was a series of code clashes causing problems for communication and collaboration, from the question at the outset, through which approaches to use and how, to the finished product. The obvious question then is, how can you avoid these problems, or how can you resolve them when they arise? Well, first, knowing is half the battle. Research into interdisciplinary learning often says that you need to be open-minded, generous, and respectful. And these concepts can show what you should be open-minded and respectful about. They can highlight how your own codes may have blind spots and other codes might see things that your own codes do not. So being aware that underlying what people say and do can be different codes to your own is in itself useful. Second, you can use the concepts as a shared language for addressing issues. You can make visible why you're having problems getting along or struggling to bring ideas together. And in doing so, you can make them less personal. It may very well be that Jane or John is a pain in the ass, but it might be also that they're using a different code to you. Third, you can also avoid problems by using the ideas to design your research. You can think about how to capture issues that different codes reveal. You can discuss who might be best at what and ensure that you're all playing to your strengths with tasks that suit your preferred codes. And you can plan to ensure that different kinds of findings are brought together in a way that makes sense. 
That might mean they're separate at first to do their own thing well, but then brought together to offer complementary insights. Or it might involve trying to integrate them from the start. How that works depends on the object of study, the research questions and your team. But these ideas can help support your discussion of these issues. Finally, it's worth noting that lots of what happened in the obesity project was actually good and involved different ways of thinking about research that offered different kinds of insights into the complex problem of obesity and people were playing to their strengths. The problem was that the team didn't pay attention to their ways of thinking. So remember to take account of your various codes in team communication, what kind of codes are appropriate and when, and make clear what you expect from others and your preferred ways of working. These are all basic issues of planning, but when you know that you have different ways of thinking about plans or about research or about how to communicate, then you can not only negotiate those differences, but you can also make a strength of your diversity. So to sum up, it's important to make visible your ways of thinking about research because you don't just bring content knowledge to this unit, you also bring deeper principles for selecting, assembling and enacting that knowledge. And in many projects, those principles will be more important. There may not be obvious need of, say, content from chemistry or from economics, but there may be ways that your knowledge code ways of thinking offer unique insights. So it's useful to understand the codes you use. It's also important to know their strengths and limitations. If all you ever do is code match between yourself and other people like you, if you just stick to one code in your project, then you're likely to see only part of the picture. Knowing why and how other codes are valuable in collaboration will translate into a more integrated, more interdisciplinary report that is likely to grasp more of the bigger picture. Finally, once you're aware of potential code clashes, you have the possibility of being more in control of your research project. You have tools that can help support task allocation and team communication and for avoiding pitfalls and figuring out solutions because every project runs into problems at some point. And remember, you're not alone. As well as your fellow students, project supervisors and unit coordinators, you also have the LCT Centre for Knowledge Building here at the university as well as the wider LCT community to call upon. If you have questions, you need support, or you just want to know more about LCT, then get in touch, whatever your codes might be. OK, here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. Welcome. My name is Carl. Oh, I can't do this. The LCT Centre for Knowledge Building. I was bouncing up and down. OK. Just as long as I'm not standing there like a weird bloke with his arms dangling down. I'm going to introduce you to... Oh, Welcome... I'll do it again. I'm going to introduce you to some ideas that will help you conduct... <laughs> Welcome... <laughs> Deeper sit... <laughs> right, this project's... F it. Start again. Yeah. That was much worse than the first one, by the way. That's... <laughs> Was rubbish. Uh, ugh, to all sorts of those f***ing each. Yes, I can hear you, Clem Fandango. You can't do that sort of thing. It's really weird. Okay. That's no, it's me. I'm being shit. First, to get you to think. In short, in short. <laughs> and remember, you're not alone. We could cut those really quickly, couldn't we? That'd be quite funny. I haven't been happy at all. Am I supposed to be smiling or happy? Every time I see people in videos, they're always f***ing happy. Me, I'm just reading this out like a monkey.